By the time I turned 14, my friends had already started getting boobs and Frenching boys, and I had yet to grow into my Calvin Klein training bra and hadn't said a word to a boy who wasn't my brother. The only changes I noticed in my body were happening above the neck. The top half of my hair had burst into a mass of thick, frizzy curls like a cloudy brown halo, while the bottom half remained stick straight and silky smooth. I had so much acne that my face looked not like a pepperoni pizza, but just the pepperoni. I had spent my childhood as a competitive gymnast, meaning that I could do more pull-ups on the monkey bars than all the boys combined, and that my body looked like that of a bull terrier. By my 15th birthday, my classmates, my friends, my dance team, my neighbors, my mom's friends' daughters, and my brother's friends' sisters had all started their periods. The only other late bloomer in the whole city was another former gymnast named Dina Van Lirup. We both joined my dance team at the same time, but had nothing in common aside from our athletic builds and propensity to doing unsolicited back handsprings after dance rehearsal. While I wanted nothing to do with her, adults stuck us together constantly the two outcasts who would not bleed. We were partnered up in dance routines, on school projects, and even in carpools. Maybe our moms thought we'd feel more comfortable being with our own kind, but actually the pairing was a cruel reminder that we didn't fit in. I wanted nothing more than to be like the other girls. Every night before dance class, my teammates huddled together on the black vinyl studio floor to exchange stories about having to run to the restroom in the middle of Spanish class because they noticed a red spot on their jeans, or to let us know they were just gonna watch that night's rehearsal because of cramps. As they bonded over their newfound womanhood, I sat in silence, too ashamed of being different to participate in the conversation. At 16, my period still hadn't shown up. Week after week, I'd revisit the 10 signs your period is coming checklist in Seventeen magazine with only one check mark to my name, acne. I lay awake in bed at night, wondering when Punky Brewster's menses had started. I prayed for my cat Spooky to live forever and for my period to come. But no matter how hard I tried to coax my body into bleeding, I remained a little girl. My mom and my grandma whispered about my delayed development over the cordless phone at night. On top of the shame and isolation I felt, I couldn't help but wonder if something was gravely wrong with my body. That maybe all those years of high impact hip banging against the uneven parallel bars had caused permanent ovarian disfigurement. But my mom didn't take me to the doctor or discuss the matter with me, beyond reassuring me that my body wouldn't look like Mary Lou Retton's forever and that I'd probably be all caught up by the time I started college. Eventually, my anxiety about my stunted growth became so tectonic that I forced myself to stop thinking about periods altogether. In fact, I had compartmentalized it so well that when I got home from ballet class one night shortly after my 17th birthday and found a tiny dot of sticky brown fluid in my pink cotton panties, I was stunned into a state of menstrual inertia. I couldn't tell my mom or a friend or a dance teacher or anybody and instead began to hide the blood and DIY my menstrual products. I wore black pants to school. I stuffed wads of Charmin Ultra into my panties and stole maxi pads from underneath my mom's bathroom sink. These pads were fucking enormous. I washed my panties in the sink before they hit the laundry. I hid the maxi pad wrappers deep in the trash can. Homesteading a period would have worked just fine, except I was a competitive dancer in the 90s and my costumes were inspired by the semi-nude backup dancers in Paula Abdul videos. There was no way I was gonna hide an apocalyptic pad bulge underneath a black pleather rhinestone studded bikini bottom the size of a Snickers wrapper. So I feigned illness or injury if I woke up in the morning of a dance competition and found blood in my panties. For a full year, not one person knew I had become a woman. I had convinced myself that if the other girls found out, they'd make fun of me and I couldn't endure more social isolation than I already felt. Dina Van Lirup had long since gotten her first period, after me, and to my horror told everyone about it. Now I was truly alone and planned to hide my period until I could go to college and forge a new identity. But the bleeding had started to become more regular, more predictable, and heavier. One Saturday afternoon, I was struck by a sudden urge to confess to my mom that my time of the month had been coming for many months. I stood at the top of the staircase and called down to my mom, who was stirring a pot of spaghetti in the kitchen. 
She walked out of the kitchen, one hand holding a wooden spoon, the other hand on her hip, in a hurry to get back to cooking. I declared my womanhood in a shaky, raspy whisper, my words deflating as they fell down the stairs toward my mom, and I had to repeat myself several mortifying times. Mom, I'm like, you know, needing to ride the cotton horse. What, honey? I need to put a mouse in my house, if you know what I mean. What, honey? I can't hear you. Mom, Aunt Flo, I... Honey, the water's gonna boil over. What on earth is going on? There's blood in my underwear. I had dreaded this moment for 12 excruciating months, painstakingly hiding my period and reusing the same monster pads for several days at a time to avoid this very moment. Her face flushed. My mom walked back into the kitchen and told my dad he had to finish making the pasta because she had to go to Vaughn's because Jen had started her period, finally. She called my grandmother first. I did not leave my room the rest of the afternoon, evening, or next morning. My mom left two pink boxes on my bathroom counter, one with pads about the thickness of a plus-size Hershey bar and a box of Slender for Teens tampons. When I finally emerged from my room the next day and sat down at the kitchen table to eat a cheese sandwich, my mom, unable to meet my eyes, asked if I'd tried the tampons. Mom? No, I think it was a false alarm. Maybe the red tide didn't arrive after all. Okay, well, try the tampons and see how they feel. Just don't do what my friend Judy did and forget you put one in there, and then put another one in the next day and forget about that one too. And three weeks later, you end up in urgent care, in unimaginable pain, only to have a young male doctor fish out two three-week-old tampons and then have to get treated for three types of infections. From the start, pads seemed like the more appealing option. I had no understanding of my anatomy, where each hole started and stopped or how they functioned as a team. I feverishly studied the diagram on the teen Tampax box, trying to visualize the subterranean architecture of my womb. But I couldn't make sense of how the main cavern branched, branched off into subcanals and microchannels, or why this was relevant information when the tampon clearly sat at the entrance. I cautiously grazed the exterior of my vagina with my fingertips and could not conceive of how something could possibly squeeze inside of it. I tore open dozens of tiny tampon wrappers, pushing, sweating, squeezing, clenching, and finally lying on the bathroom floor in tears, defeated and ready to quit the dance team that was my whole life. I knew I had to find a way to get that sucker up there, come hell or high water. I spent the next few days holed up in my bedroom, sticking random objects into my vagina, objects narrower than tampons, thinking I could work my way up in size. I had finally located the correct orifice, but there was a flap of skin stretching over it, and I thought in all likelihood I was deformed. I would not only have to quit dance, but also there was no way a penis was going in or a baby was coming out, ever. This caused me great concern, but I remembered what my mom always told me in difficult times. If you set your mind to it, anything is possible. The smallest tampon shaped object I could find in my room was a Lisa Frank glitter pencil. And by means of contorting my body into every conceivable shape, I found I could access the right hole if I lay down on my back, drew my knees into my chest, and consciously relaxed my pelvic muscles. In went the glitter pencil. Not very far, just past the eraser, but I was proud of the progress I had made. I even joined the family that night for Little Caesar's pizza and breadsticks. The next day I repeated the exercise with a more sensible object, a Q-tip. Bingo, I could get it all the way in. After the Q-tip achievement, I was unstoppable. Every object I saw around the house that mimicked the shape and size of tiny tampons was fair game. I spent a month practicing every day with a tube of Revlon cherries in the snow lipstick, a Tootsie Roll with the wrapper on, and a wad of gauze. Until finally one Sunday morning, I got into position on my bed, implored my vagina to relax, and pushed the dainty tampon all the way in. I was so relieved that I left it in until bedtime and I remembered the label on the box warning of toxic shock syndrome. Thus began my tepid relationship with tampons. 
Once I understood that menstrual products required as much care as an infant, my shame was replaced by fear. Would I leave it in too long and die of an infection? What if the string got lost and I had to have the tampon surgically removed? Or worse, what if the audience saw the string poking out of my leotard while I did the splits during a dance performance? Of course, I didn't confide in my friends because they all still thought I was a child. Besides my mom, who probably told all the other moms, I never told anyone I had started my period. Not even my best friends Annie or Bethany, who had moved past period drama and were already on to their first pregnancy scares. My mom's words about being caught up by the time I went to college stuck with me. Underneath those words was a deeper understanding that I would leave behind the horrors of being a teenage girl and start a new life as a young woman. In the fall of that year, my mom helped me pack my room into the back of her red Jeep Cherokee and drove me to college. I walked into my freshman dorm room with my extra long twin sheet set, a Bob Marley poster, and several boxes of menstrual products. For the first time, I finally felt like I fit in. That is, of course, until three weeks later when it became apparent I was the only virgin in the entire dormitory.